Nair Tandon has uh, come at me directly on Twitter, and this is one of my favorites. She says, important thread, Jimmy Dore has created multiple videos to attack me. I ignore them, but they could be both vicious and ludicrous. Well, I don't know how she knows that they're both vicious and ludicrous if she's ignoring them. And I don't know if she knows that by tweeting about them, that is a, the definition of not ignoring them. <laughs> so you know they're mo they're vicious and ludicrous because you watch them. That's also not ignoring them. <laughs> Someone needs to explain to you what ignore means. So and why do I bring up Naritanen? Because oh my God, the U.S. Senate will convene hearings on the confirmation of Naritanen to lead President Joseph Biden's Office of Management and Budget this Tuesday, which today's Monday, which is tomorrow. And what's going to be, well, um, what's going to be funny is watching Bernie Sanders say nice things about her. And I'm going to tell you why that's funny in just a second. But let me just tell you who she is real quick. She, she's uh, she's one of these people. She's one of these neocons who calls herself a lefty. She's not. She's a corporatist. And I'm going to show you how she's also uh, an imperialist. Um so she's for cutting Social Security. I have the videotape of her. We're going to show that later of her advocating for cutting Social Security. Uh, there it is. She says we need to put both entitlements on the table as well as taxes. There, that's that's her quote from her. But this is from WikiLeaks. So now we've showed you this a couple of times on the show before, and this is why Nara Tannen doesn't like us at the Jimmy Dore Show, is because we reported that what WikiLeaks revealed, and this is an email um, from Faz Shakur, who was at the Center for American Progress, which Nair Tannen is the president of, or was, and uh, he went on to become Bernie Sanders' campaign manager. And inside this email, what is revealed? Faz Shakur says, I don't think it's fair that we create our own domestic problems and then ask other nations to pay for it. You see the adverse incentive problem here, right? Faz Shakur, if we think we can make money off an incursion, we'll do it. That's a serious policy messaging moral problem for our foreign policy. Nair Tandon says we have a so he's saying, hey, we we should stop invading other countries because there's financial gain for it. That's not good. Nair Tandon comes back with we have a giant deficit. They have a lot of oil. Most Americans would choose not to engage in the world because of that deficit. If we want to continue to engage in the world, gestures like having oil rich countries pay us back doesn't seem crazy to me. So what she's doing there, they're talking about Libya and she's saying we need to take their oil to pay for our invasion of their country to overthrow it. That's what she's saying. And the reason why we want to take their money is because if we don't take their oil money, we're going to have to cut social programs at home. So we need to kill people in Libya, devastate their country, steal their natural resources so we don't have a political problem at home of hurting our people at back here. So that's what she's advocating for. Who else advocated for that? We bomb the oil, take the oil, bomb the oil, take the oil. Just take it. Right. I've been saying that for four years. Who else said that? The rebels were. But I'll tell you what, I'm only interested in Libya if we take the oil. If we don't take the oil, I have no interest in Libya. So, so there is Nara Tandon was the precursor to Donald Trump's imperialism stealing the oil strategy. Uh, and here's what she said about Julian Assange after Julian Assange revealed that she was for imperialism and stealing other countries' natural resources to pay for those things. She says this about Julian Assange. There are many cultists on this site, but the Assange cultists are the worst. Assange was the agent of a proto-fascist state, Russia, to undermine democracy. That is fascist behavior. Anyone on the left should abhor what he did, not celebrate it. No, what he did was expose your fascist behavior, Nira Tannen, and now you want to continue with more fascist behavior by persecuting and prosecuting journalists who tell truths about powerful people like yourself advocating for stealing other countries' natural resources. That's why she wants to kill Julian Assange, and that's why she wants to come at the Jimmy Dore show. So you get it, right? So I reported what Julian Assange did. She wants to get rid of him. She wants to get rid of me because I report what Julian Assange reported. That's what this is all about. And now she's going into Joe Biden's, uh, Joe Biden's administration, and here is the article from the Gray Zone, 
It says, will the Senate scrutinize Biden's budget nominee, ter- Nara Tandon's apparent pay-for-play foreign policy corruption? And this is from our guest, Max Blumenthal. And real quickly, he says, as president of the Center for American Progress, Nara Tandon raked in whopping donations from repressive right-wing foreign governments while she advanced their hardline policy priorities in Washington. Will the Senate ask her about these sordid arrangements? I got $2,000 check that says, no, they won't. How about that? Okay. Uh, Tandon is a veteran Democratic Party operative best known for her fanatical loyalty, fanatical loyalty to Hillary Clinton, intemperate online commentary and visceral loathing of anything remotely affiliated with Bernie Sanders. Under Tandon's watch, CAP raked in hefty donations from foreign governments and their lobbying operations while churning out policy papers and organizing events that furthered those donors' interests inside the Beltway. And who were those donors? Those donors included lobbyists from the apartheid regime of Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the United Arab Emirates, whose ambassador to the U.S. publicly thanked Center for American Progress for a favorable report it published following a series of substantial donations, and the administration of Taiwan, which used Center for American Progress as a vehicle to campaign for more hostile U.S. policy towards China. These apparent pay-for-play arrangements were defining features of Tannen's time at the helm of the one of the most heavily funded Beltway think tank operations, the Center for American Progress. But strangely, as her confirmation to Biden's administration moves forward, even her fiercest adversaries in the Senate have not signaled any intent to scrutinize the ethical baggage she accumulated while pushing the Democratic Party to adopt a decidedly neoconservative foreign policies. And of course, you know what happened in Libya. Executions, torture, slave markets persist in Libya. And this is what she said. Hey, which entities want American troops totally removed from Iraq? Iran and ISIS. (laughs) So let's bring in uh, Max right now. So uh, Max, I want you to come on and give the balance. Tell me some of the good stuff about Neratana because I don't want it to be all negative. And so that's why I have you on. Uh, tell me. <laughs> I want to give a fair and balanced approach to Neratana. This, this pattern of Nera's tantrums. And there's a reason she's earned the nickname Nero Tandon for this kind of outrageous behavior, which is often in defense of Hillary Clinton. I mean, you ask Hillary Clinton one critical question about her role in falsely whipping up WMD hysteria on the Senate floor, which ultimately led to the death of around 1 million Iraqis. And you get physically assaulted. (laughs) Um, So this kind of behavior is familiar to people online who've encountered her. And I was telling a story about how I criticized John McCain and pointed out these racist comments he made. Uh, I hate the gooks and I always will hate them, John McCain said. I mean, he refused to apologize for that. And then she comes in and starts attacking me and accusing me of helping Trump and starts making comments about my childhood and just trying to personally dehumanize me uh, for criticizing the biggest neocon warmonger in the Senate. And this is the kind of, uh, you know, behavior we're familiar with, but it conceals, I think, a much more salient issue about just pure sleaze, corruption, and the real concrete role that she has played in infecting the Democratic Party with militarism and neoconservatism by raking in money from people and governments who are not unlike Donald Trump around the, in the rest of the world, and taking that money and then advancing those governments' militaristic interests in Washington. One figure I would point to is Shinzo Abe, who is the former prime minister of Japan, Near Tannen flew out to Tokyo to have a friendly meeting. She proudly tweeted an image of herself with Abe. And then as Cap proceeded to take between 200, I think 100,000 and $250,000 a year from the embassy of Japan, Near Tannen proceeded to advance closer ties between the US and Japan, of course, to counter China, to turn up the new Cold War with China. Let's just talk about who Abe is, because this is lesser known. I mean, we can get into her relationship with Netanyahu, cozying up to him. But Abe is the maternal grandson of a Japanese 
war criminal who led slave labor camps in Manchuria during the Japanese occupation of China. He has paid homage repeatedly at the Yasukuni Shrine to 14 Japanese class A war criminals who committed the most heinous acts in Korea and China. He's a right wing figure who's done everything he can to undermine Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, which prevents Japan from having a standing offensive army. He's whittled away at individual liberties in Japan, tried to beef up surveillance, crack down on activists, and just generally tried to remilitarize Japan. And this is who Nira flies halfway across the earth to make. Uh, ties with and then effectively lobbies for. I mean, anyone watching this right now, just Google Center for American Progress in Japan and you're gonna find all these policy papers making right-wing Japan out to be the top US ally in the Pacific Rim. Same thing happened with Taiwan, which is another government that has a very, or a fairly hard line uh, leadership in Tsai Ing-wen and has been dumping hundreds of thousands of dollars every year into the Center for American Progress. And you know, look up Taiwan and Center for American Progress. You're gonna find all these articles, including in Caput and other publications, adv advancing closer ties between the US and Taiwan to turn up the heat on China. And they never acknowledge that they're essentially being paid to do that. And last year, Nira Tandon hosted a webinar with Taiwan's president, Tsai, and it was co-hosted by the Hudson Institute, which is the new employer of Mike Pompeo, the most hardline militaristic neoconservative secretary of state and worst secretary of state in recent US history, also funded by the government of Taiwan. And the, the, the Taiwanese president, the, one of the first things she starts doing is bragging about how much she's increased the military budget. Our military budget is unprecedented. We're buying more weapons than ever before which relates back to Neera Tandon at the Center for American Progress, who has hired as senior fellows, former vice presidents for defense contractors like Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. Uh, I think someone who's on the board of Lockheed Martin right now, Rudy De Leon, is a former uh, executive at the Center for American Progress and CAP has been funded by the arms industry as well. So it all, it all fits together along with all the corporate money she's taking in. And we haven't even gotten into her censoring and forcing employees out the door for daring to criticize Benjamin Netanyahu, the uh, apartheid Lord of Israel, who is fully aligned with the Republican party, who fully aligned himself with Donald Trump, who named a settlement after Donald Trump in the Golan Heights, and Neera Tandon hosted Netanyahu in 2015. And as we learned from internal Center for American Progress emails, she did so in order to court Israel lobby donors. So it's all about the money with her, and this is the person that they're gonna put in, in charge of the money. Biden's budget director to, to, to <clears throat> overlook, to look over the money. She's a ghoul. Uh, and, well, and also what people probably don't know is that she's a union buster. Think Progress, uh, which was run by the Center for America, funded by the Center for American Progress, they unionized. And what yeah. did she do? Well, Think Progress then shut it down after they unionized. The Center for America's Progress. That, that, isn't that amazing? Uh, also, here's here's another uh, revealed email from WikiLeaks. Near attend and Brown. This is this is their strategy. Uh, to help Hillary Clinton, Brown and women pundits can shame the times and others on social media. So if anybody criticized Hillary Clinton, they would get women and Brown people, Brown and women pundits can shame the times and others on social media. Joan Walsh, Matt and Galatius, Alan Perry, Bacon, Greg Sargent to defend her is help. So, so that's the people in the media. They were going to get to be in the tank for Hillary Clinton. And the, they were going to use identity politics to shame anybody who criticized her. Uh, uh, they can be emboldened for what it's worth. I pushed to do this a year ago. So that that's, that's that. And that's just kind of regular. That's par for the course, right, Max? It's it, yeah. I mean, look at what she did to Matt Brunig when he was at De Demos. Um, Matt Brunig is a left-wing economist who dared to challenge Joan Walsh and Neera Tandon on Twitter. And I think he wound up calling Neera Tandon sleazy. I think, you know, read my article and tell me if that's sleazy or not, what she's doing. 
Um, but she took extreme measures, calling Demos, calling their, I don't know if she called their funders, but she was, she was working the phones and really taking time out of her day, day after day, to make sure that he got fired for challenging her on Twitter. So she, I mean, and this is someone who's was not in a senior position in Washington. I mean, this is a young person working their way up who is offering an alternative version of the uh, neoliberal economics that she represents. But I mean, she's also positioned herself kind of as a feminist. I think her Twitter bio says she's a feminist. And the United Arab Emirates is not a, fe a place where uh, feminists would find allies. The United Arab Emirates is a permanent monarchy run by a literal king. It's basically run by a crown prince, Mohammed bin Zayed. And women don't really have rights there. Uh, not, it's, it's certainly not a liberal democracy. And Neera Tandon has raked in up to a million dollars a year. I think it was $700,000 in 2016 from the United Arab Emirates at the Center for American Progress. Their support for the United Arab Emirates and its agenda, its agenda in the Middle East, which is par partly includes to perpetrate the worst human humanitarian catastrophe in the world in Yemen, their support was so strong that when they issued another one of these phony policy papers, which basically read like a press release for the United Arab Emirates embassy that was funding them, calling for a, basically a wish list of Saudi and Emirati demands across the Middle East, saying almost nothing about Yemen, the ambassador to the UAE in Washington, who was hosted on a panel by Tandon's think tank, personally thanked them for that policy paper. And there's more to it. The policy paper was co-authored by a former employee of the embassy of the United Arab Emirates. It's not like they're even going to some policy experts. They're like, we're just gonna bring in the guy who gave us the money to write a paper for us, and then we're gonna host his boss to praise us in Washington. And this is a permanent monarchy that is represents the most anti-feminist, anti-humanist agenda you could possibly find on the planet paying Neera Tannen's bills. I mean, will this be brought up? No, this will, will not. Will Bernie Sanders bring this up or will he raise a mitten in approval of this pay for play sleazemonger who's supposed to oversee the budget for the president? It's really disturbing that we need to even ask those kinds of questions. But again, this is Washington and this is business as usual. I mean, these kind of arrangements, unfortunately, that's that's how the think tanks work in Washington. So you know, the, her going after Matt Brunig like that and getting him trying to get him fired. Right now, the Biden administration. In the next story, we're going to show you how people inside the Biden administration were having meetings with Silicon Valley on who to censor. And so now she's right in the belly of the beast. She's going to be having meetings with those same people who come right from Silicon Valley telling them who to censor. And so that's her go to is if you criticize her, she tries to get you fired, uh, scare anybody from criticizing her again and try to get you deplatformed, which is what she tried to do to me. And why I had to remind well, people on the left that uh, censorship is bad, even if the guy saying stuff is saying mean stuff about you. You shouldn't try go. That was a, that was with Carlos Maza. And they use yeah. and they use that. Uh, go ahead. Well, this is someone who's presided over a reign of censorship on behalf of her donors at the Center for American Progress, is specific, specifically um, pro apartheid, pro Israeli apartheid donors, uh, pro Israeli apartheid lobbyists who began targeting bloggers who were at Think Progress back in 2011, who dared to stand up to Netanyahu and criticize his drive for war with Iran. And they said, basically, you got to fire these guys. These are, you know, young bloggers in their 20s who are anti-war. You got to get rid of them. So she starts clamping down. She begins removing uh, without any note or explanation parts of their articles, which, for example, linked the Israel lobby to anti-Muslim campaigns in the U.S. And then in 2015, Center for American Progress releases a report. It's called Fear Incorporated 2.0. It's the second part of a very laudable report about the rise of Islamophobia in the US. And it singles out Mike Bloomberg, um, not exactly the most progressive figure, longtime Republican mayor of New York, for the secret demographics unit that he ran 
oh, it, through the NYPD to spy on Muslims and basically all aspects of Muslim life in New York, but also outside of New York, going as far as spying on students at the Muslim Student Society at Yale University. And so there was a chapter in this report that criticized Bloomberg's demographics unit, mentioned his name eight times, and that chapter, after publication, disappeared. And the person who oversaw that publication, Yasmin Taib, she later told the New York Times that we were told that Bloomberg was really unhappy with us and we have to take this out. Bloomberg happened to be a mega donor to the Center for American Progress. So basically anyone who paid Nira's bills gets to censor what takes place at this supposedly progressive think tank, which was providing advice to Democrats. And they were just, they the donors have their way. And how can we expect that that culture won't be present in a Biden administration with someone in an influential position well, like the M OMB uh, with Nira presiding over well, that position? Well, of course it is. Of course. I mean, I, I mean, the whole goddamn Biden administration is one big corrupt corporate maniacs. I mean, that's all it is. So let, let me move well, on. Let it's me... about to get more corrupt with this. Yeah. So here and here she is. So, so you remember she wanted to cut Social Security and here she is saying it. Um, I think the question really is, if we're going to have a deal to address long term deficit reduction, we need to put both entitlements on the table as well as taxes. It's unfair to ask only middle class Americans to bear the burden of our deficits. So what she's saying is we need to have the poor <laughs> that she say we can't just have middle class people pay for our deficits. We have to have poor people pay for it because they're the ones causing it. Do yeah. you think I'm kidding? Plus, Americans actually didn't create the deficits. Um, so I think. So and who did the goddamn poor people? That's who that's. And by the way, it makes perfect sense. because I mean, We have a deficit. We have Social Security and Medicare looming. The number of people on Social Security and Medicare is now 40 million people. It's going to be 80 million in 15 years. Would you consider looking at those programs? Age of eligibility, absolutely. cost of living, put it all on the table. The answer is absolutely you have. To. Yeah, of course. So that's why she's perfect for him. He wants to cut Social Security. She wants to cut Social Security and Medicare. And that's what's going to happen. And here she is trying to get me deplatformed. Uh, but watch this. So before she was nominated to be in Joe Biden's cabinet, she, this is, was her bio on Twitter. President of America, American Progressive Center for American Progress. A progressive, an Indian American. What's her position on Modi? I wonder why nobody's asking what her position on Modi is. Remember, they couldn't stop bringing up Modi with Tulsi Gabbard. I never heard Modi's name until Tulsi Gabbard, and now you never hear it again ever again. Isn't that Amazing. funny? As soon as they got rid of Tulsi Gabbard, they never bring up Modi again. Isn't that? A, hey, what's Kamala Harris's position on Modi? I guess we'll never know, isn't she? What's her position? I guess we'll never. Doesn't matter. If you're going along with war, you don't have to have a position on Modi. Isn't that amazing? So she used to call. I, I, she used to call herself a. Go ahead. You want to say something? No, I, I think you you said it all. But I think we need we should mention that near a tendon while attacking just viciously attacking Tulsi Gabbard because she touched the third rail in Washington, which is the bipartisan imperialist foreign policy consensus, and dared to challenge regime change wars. Near a tendon joined that ferocious mob attacking her while Neera Tandon f went and met with Narendra Modi personally and boasted about it on Twitter and has forged very close ties with the Hindu nationalist community that, that, that exists in the U S to support Modi and his BJP party. Modi, you know, controversial. I don't even know. It, it's, it's toxic because he helped preside over the Gujarat massacre of thousands of Muslims uh, when he was a local governor, and he has since just put the uh, Hindu nationalist movement on overdrive. He's the subject of one of the biggest, largest protests in the world uh, this year of Indian farmers protesting his privatization and neoliberal policies. But you're right, she won't be asked about it because she's not only going along with the permanent war agenda, she has helped craft that That's agenda. Right. She has helped cultivate advisors to the Democrats to push that agenda. And she's done it by lining her pockets and the, or the, the pockets of her think tank, filling the coffers of this think tank with money from repressive right wing foreign governments seeking a more militaristic line in Washington. One of the good example would be Benjamin Netanyahu, who she hosted in 2015. 
who is just on, is still on the warpath for a war with Iran. Yeah. It's a real reason why there won't be a return to the Iran deal, the JCPOA, along with you know pro-Israel figures like Tony Blinken, the new Secretary of State, who said that like supporting Israel is in his blood. It's like in his genes or something. He said that at an APAC meeting. I mean, imagine if you know someone said uh, you know supporting Russia is in my genes. Right. I know. So. So, so near a tandem after, you know, coming under attack from the Israel lobby for having a few bloggers at her think tank criticizing war with Iran, she hosts Netanyahu internal. It's a complete giggle fest. Like it's a love fest in this closed door environment where everyone in the crowd is an Israel lobbyist and Netanyahu is cracking racist jokes and she's giggling along. And then she uh, emails John Podesta who is a co-founder of CAP and says, well, no one can call us anti-Semitic anymore. So we accomplished that goal. And uh, she also then fires off another email chirping to Podesta. Jonathan Levine is joining the board. Who is So So Netanyahu is worth it. She said, so Netanyahu is worth it. Who is Jonathan Levine? He is a Bain Capital executive who is a major donor to the Israel lobby. And by bringing him on the board, she means we brought on a new donor. So Netanyahu is worth it. So by giggling along with one of the worst human rights violators in the world who's on the cam campaigning for a gigantic regional war in the Middle East in order to bring in some Bain capital, vulture capitalist as a donor, Nira Tannen says it was worth it. I don't think anything distills her values better than that one email. Well, here's how I, I wanted to show that I, I agree with that. So that's amazing. But before she was nominated, I want to show people she would call herself a progressive. Now that she's in the Joe, uh, going to be oh. in the Joe Biden <laughs> administration, she switched it to liberal. Literally, she used to be Center for American Progress, progressive Indian American. Now she's Center for American Progress, progressive liberal. What the fuck? She took out the progressive and switched it to liberal. Awesome. She's an interesting character profile because she has been on Twitter getting in our faces while the rest of them, many of these other officials, uh, they stay out of those debates. They stay out. They stay. They stay out of the 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 um, the playpen and they don't engage every time they speak online. It's some boilerplate statement. So we don't actually know what awful human beings they are. And uh, the fact that they're all welcoming near a tandem and that there's so little criticism of her being appointed to such high position shows they really just don't care about that kind of behavior or this culture of corruption that was fostered under her watch. Uh, and it would be amazing if all these Biden officials, uh, figures like Samantha Power actually showed their true colors on Twitter because they, they are under like strict PR guidance not to reveal their true personality. <laughs> Hey, everybody, this is the part where I tell you where all our live shows are, but there aren't any. And then this is why I tell you, rejoin our premium program, get extra content, but nobody's got a fucking job. So just enjoy the video.